Kaitsaka Kwanza Lopska Kipa Tranakoil. So, all my respected friends, my name is Sonnet Labe. I'm a professor of English and Creative Writing here at BIU and the chair of the Gustafson Committee. And I'd like to thank you all for gathering here. Welcome to the 2018 Gustafson Distinguished Poets Lecture given this year by the esteemed Lorna Crozier. I'd like to first acknowledge that we're meeting tonight on the traditional territory of the Sinanaamu people, and that we are grateful to live, work, and learn on these lands, the lands with which the Sinanaamu uh, continue to have an ongoing relationship. So um, tonight, uh, I'm just going to say a little bit about the trust and thank a few people, and then Acting Dean Marnie Stanley is, is going to say a few words, and then um, my colleague, Dr. Deborah Torco, will introduce uh, Lorna Crozier officially and fulsomely. So, um, the Ralph and Betty Gustafson Trust was established at VIU in 1998 from this, the estate of the late Ralph Gustafson, who lived from 1909 to 1995. He was one of Canada's preeminent poets and uh, wrote two dozen books of poetry, um, some essays, a book of short stories, and compiled the first anthology of Canadian poetry, published in 1942. His book, uh, Fire on Stone, published in 1974, won the Governor General's Award for Poetry. And he was a member of the Order of Canada, co-founder of the League of Canadian Poets. And for six decades, Ralph Gustafson practiced his craft and shared his love of language with successive generations of poets, um, some of whom here at VIU. With the support of his widow, Betty Gustafson, the Trust endows an annual chair of poetry at Vancouver Island University. Um, and this chair is devoted to advancing Canadian poetry um, and supporting deserving poets. Uh, if you are interested in donating to the Trust, uh, we can help you out with that. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, the Gustafson Chair, since 1999, has recognized the careers of some of Canada's most well-loved and respected poets, including Patrick Lane, Robert Bringhurst, Dion Brand, Katharina Vermette, George Elliott Clark, Fred Waugh, Aaron Moray, and now, of course, Lorna Crozier. In addition to the Trust, I'd like to thank Marnie Stanley and the Faculty of Arts and Humanities and the Canada Council for the Arts for their sponsorship of this award. I'd also like to thank the members of the Gustafson Committee, Rhonda Bailey, Joy Googler, and Paul Watkins, and the former chair of the committee, Tony Smith, for all of their help in setting up these events. And thank you all also to VIU Catering, who uh, will, is doing the reception afterwards, uh, VIU Parking, VIU Bookstore, who's manning the table, and uh, yeah, I'd just like to say also welcome to our Chancellor, Louise Mandel, who's here. Thank you to the students and to the community members who've come out to all the events so far. Um, and thank you all for being here tonight. Please uh, welcome Acting Dean Marty Stanley. much for coming tonight. I think it's a good night to sit together and listen to a poet wash words through our minds and give us things to think about. I'd like to thank you all for coming. This is our 20th anniversary of the Gustafson. Um, I'd like to remind you to make sure your phones are on vibrate. <laughs> it's more fun, let's face it. <laughs> the media studies students for filming tonight's event. Enjoy. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Professor Deborah Torco, who will introduce our poet. to Canadian literature, her teaching and her mentoring with five honorary doctorates, most recently from McGill and Simon Fraser University. Her books have received numerous national awards, including the Governor General's Award for Poetry, the Golden Mail declared the Book of Marbles, a compendium of everyday things, one of its top 100 books of the year in 2012. And Amazon chose her memoir as one of the 100 books you should read in your lifetime. A professor emerita at the University of Victoria, 
She has performed for Queen Elizabeth II and has read her poetry, which has been translated into several languages on every continent except Antarctica. And that's your next trip. Her latest book, What the Soul Doesn't Want, was nominated for the 2017 Governor General's Award for Poetry. In 2018, Lorna Crozier received the George Woodcock Lifetime Achievement Award. She lives on Vancouver Island with Patrick Lane and two cats who love to garden. It's the cats that love to garden? And you and Patrick? <laughs> Lorna Crozier's poetry is witty, poignant, beautifully plain spoken, with startling clear moments of revelation, quick, deep, Alice Munro-like glances into our very nature. Reading Lorna's poems is like meeting someone, Michael Dennis tells us, with small town manners and common sense, as well as big city savvy. Of Lorna's most recent collection, God of Shadows, Jan Zwicky announces, all good poets notice things. But Lorna Crozier cares. She cares personally about what she notices, and her special gift is her sense for the caring that arises in other things. Recklessly exuberant, acute and pensive by turns, these new poems exhibit Crozier's signature interest in the world's odd, angled, and gawky glory. How it shines in, cloudless, in the cloudless wide days of her heart. Her poetry is praised for its scope and breadth of view, for its range of voice, tone, subject matter, and, above all, for its artistry, humor, openness, and accessibility. Her poems can be funny, <coughs> erotic, <coughs> radiant, joyful, and elegiac. And they display her alertness, her attention, Lorna Crozier loves to watch, and during her reading at White Sales last night, she urged us to watch, to pay attention, to look around, to look, and to see. Her poems cast meaning on the things she attends to. She shows us that they mean. Her poetic attention turns to the natural world, prairie and west coast landscapes, to gardens, to explorations of place, family relationships and community, to culture, to challenging old stories and inherited myths with feminist revisions, to social injustices, <coughs> racism, political violence and sexual abuse, to environmental degradation. If, as Stephen Hyphen claims, poetry is the art of calling things by their true and secret names, and if, every time we use the wrong word, the world slips farther out of focus and reach, then it behooves us to read good poems. Lorna's poems explore philosophical, political, spiritual, and emotional issues, while, at the same time, they appear to be talking about the ordinary and the everyday. What I especially admire is how her poems don't allow us to dwell in abstractions. Rather, what her poems accomplish so beautifully is to particularize abstractions and give them a human face through anecdote and personal experience, as she writes about the ordinary and the extraordinary, the beautiful and the terrible, human desires and human loss, sadness and joy. Poetry is work. It is the work of telling the truth, that is, perceiving and responding to the real. And writing that is rooted in the real has power, that power to move us, to break your heart, or make you shout for joy. Her poetic attention calls into language what might otherwise remain silent and invisible. You can observe a lot just by watching an epigraph from her Book of Marvels, a Global Mail top book, top 100 book of 2012. She shows us the marvelous in common, ordinary, everyday things. Bobby pins, button, clothes hanger, doorknob, scissors, shovel, sky, snail, the kitchen sink. Well, I think you get the idea. Lorna's curiosity and her probing gaze animate the beauty and 
and the genius of these small things found everywhere around us. When we read her poems, we are dishabituated from our usual ways of not seeing the marvelous and the mystery of the everyday. It's as though we are seeing the things around us as if for the first time. Her poems startle with their sense of wonder and astonishment at the natural world, the soul's world, the exterior world, and the interior world. And she does all of this with gracious candor and fearless honesty. I first came to Laura's work in an undergraduate course on uh, Canadian poetry. And when I was thinking about how I might introduce Lorna, I reflected on my reading of her work over the years. And as crazy as this might seem, I had this vague recollection of the first Lorna Crozier poem I read. I thought, onions. Didn't I read a poem about onions and their many layers? I decided it best not to rely on my memory. I found my old anthology, and there was that poem, Onions on page 677 of 20th Century Poetry and Poetics, 4th edition, edited by Gary Geddes. <laughs> now, now here is that poem, and, and I hope, Lorna, you'll forgive me for reading it. Uh, the onion, onions. The onion loves the onion. It hugs its many layers, saying, oh, 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 each vowel smaller than the last. Some say it has no heart. It doesn't need one. It surrounds itself, feels whole, primordial, first among vegetables. If he had bitten it instead of the apple, how different paradise. <laughs> no wonder I remembered onions. What strikes me about this poem, published in 1985, now, as then, is how Lorna uses the ordinary but wholly necessary vegetable, we use it in our soups and stews and salads, how she infuses it with serious wit and, significantly, feminist revision of a story from the Bible. And there is more. Recently, I can't believe just recently, I also discovered this, Onions, is but one from a sequence of poems titled Sex Lives of Vegetables. <laughs> Talk about the garden going on without us, another collection published in 1985. Those cucumbers, cauliflowers, tomatoes, peas, and carrots, oh my goodness, those carrots, uh, these are the poems simultaneously light, humorous, and serious. You should read them. In Lorna's poems, there's always a twist that takes me by surprise. And they remind me what skilled poets do. They can show rather than tell. They can respond accurately to what they watch, to what they see, and to what they perceive. Hers are poems that show us our capacity to experience astonishment and to stop still in that astonishment for an extended moment or two an undeniable and much welcome gift in this, our contemporary, if not frenetic, world. I showed Lorna's poem, Polar, to my first and third year literature classes. Lorna was asked to write a poem about what she was seeing during her time on board the Canada C-3 ship for Lake Seven of its 150-day journey <coughs> sailing expedition across um, the, uh, the, across the coastline, or traveled by the coastline from Toronto to Victoria through the Northwest Passage from June 1 to October 28, uh, 2017. And uh, Polar is a poem that she wrote about one of her experiences on that journey. What, what captivated her heart and mind was witnessing a huge flat iceberg. And I quote a couple of lines from her poem. The size of her childhood neighborhood floating by in all its melting glory. Bianca Perrin, a Canadian paleoclimatologist, was also on this leg of the journey and had studied <coughs> this ice in northern Greenland before it broke away from the huge Peterman Glacier. Bianca said to Lorna, it's like we're going by a dying whale. 
How to express the exhilaration mixed with sorrow in a poem, our poet asked herself. But Lorna does. She watches the ice, quote, as the silent centuries of snow inside its walls still fall and fall. The response to Lorna's reading of her poem, with its stunning cinematography and original music from musician Rose Cousins, rendered our classes silent. Her words, the images, and the music all left us speechless. A, a kind of reverse poetic effect. The poems rendered us usually chattering beings silent. Polar stopped us still in astonishment for an extended moment or two. It left us with a hard truth about the rapidity with which our world is being destroyed. Polar reminds the natural world has meaning, profound meaning. And the response from the class was to see and hear the poem again, and so we did. Polar attuned our thinking to the real, extra-human world to face full-on a difficult truth. As one commentator to Lorna's prose piece, uh, Worn Out by Wonder, which describes her journey on the Canada C3 trip, wrote, we need scientists to gather the data, but we need artists to help us grasp what it really means. There is dark, but there is always, always light in the dark. And Lorna alerts her readers to that light. Her poems respond to the light and the joy and the remarkable beauty. She gives voice to the, to the uh, fullness of the human and the non-human, to relationships with each other, with onions, with icebergs. Her poetic attention, her critical and creative thinking, her courtesy, delight, console, and instruct with honesty and with truth. One reviewer commenting on her 2017 collection, What the Soul Doesn't Want, declares, Lorna Crozier's signature wit and striking imagery are on display as she stretches her wings and reminds us that we haven't yet seen all that she can do. And thank goodness for that. It is our great privilege to see and hear more of what Lorna Crozier can do. Please join me in welcoming this year's Ralph Wisconsin <coughs> Chair of Poetry, Lorna Crozier. out and show you who I am before I disappear in my short fashion behind these machines and the microphone. So you'll have to pretend I'm here. Can you hear me though? Yes. Okay. The Underworld. The river Styx has no beginning, no end. Impossible for you to robe its waters. It's merely a metaphor for grief. But the dog is real. People like to tell you their dog is a rescue dog. This one isn't. He's set his coat on fire. Mother, mother, you say, hoping she'll appear. You didn't know she had that in her. So much anguish, so many damaged wings. The poet said, all wounds close at night. Not true. There is the bird torn open. There is the naked heart, the gash in the spruce. Perhaps it is morning here. Wait a few hours. The sutures may happen. A bone needle threaded with an eternal sleeper's drool. Not as What makes you inconsolable is the silence. No wind in leaves, no grass speaking. 
the shadows are more than shadows. And there is a lot of waiting. Only one doctor and all these cities of the dead. So this poem has nothing to do with my talk. But I thought, if a poet who's giving a talk can't introduce the talk with a poem, who the hell can? And I was thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful if we used poems to introduce absolutely everything? Uh, to introduce ourselves to the world in the morning, to introduce our family dinners instead of a benediction, use a poem for a benediction. Think of what would have happened to Nanaimo City Council if they read a poem at the beginning of poems at the beginning of faculty and departmental meetings. Wouldn't that change things for the better? Uh, and before I start, I want to introduce the poet laureate of Nanaimo. Tina Fiello is here, gracing us with her. I hope you all knew that Nanaimo had a poet laureate, and there she is. And she writes poems for city council. She just wrote one for the new council. So my, my talk, I talk about making you nervous about a talk. I mean, you can give a talk, but then they tell you it's going to be published in a beautiful chapbook series. And they send you all the chapbooks of other poets before you, and you think, holy shit. <laughs> I have to take this really seriously, right? I can't mess around. So I've spent months on this talk. I'm so glad the day is finally here, <laughs> and I can stop going into my computer and revising it one more time. At a certain point, you don't know if you're bruising the poor thing or improving it. I've uh, divided my talk into 15 stanzas, and stanza is Italian for room or stopping place. So there are 15 stopping places in what I'm going to be saying, and each of them, the end of each of them, is signaled by a poem. Um, this is not my last book, What the Soul Doesn't Want. I have another one which just came out this fall called God of Shadows. But the poems, with just a couple of exceptions, are from What the Soul Doesn't Want because they seem to fit in more with what I was saying. Writing and Risk. Writing and Risk, for me, an inevitable pairing would mean something else if I were writing in Turkey or Saudi Arabia or China, especially if I were part of a minority and a woman. My position as a Canadian white professor emerita radically diffuses the dangers of any risks I might take on as a poet. Margaret Atwood reminds us that in other countries, poets are incarcerated and killed. Here, she says, tongue in cheek, we can say whatever we want because no one is listening anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, I want to propose that every time we venture into poetry, if we want to say something that matters, we hazard, we menace, we bet our lives on it, at least metaphorically. And metaphor is poetry's home. Lines for the Earth. A long line of black ants moves across the sand, so many they carve a trail. So many, if you step on one, the line will not break. It is time tracking itself. It is one vast mind moving forward. Ant after ant, each bears a round white syllable. Somewhere, they are stringing them together. Somewhere, under the earth, they are spelling it out. <laughs> because poetry is the art of the fewest words possible, it brushes up against silence. It blunders its way into speaking, knocking against our deep knowing that language falls short of what we struggle to utter. When we are sure of what we're saying, we are far away from poetry. 
It survives and creates itself only in the places where words resist. Poetry's task to convey the effing ineffable into vowel and consonant can happen only in the in-between states of ambiguity and hush. No matter who we are, nothing we've written in the past can help us. The tracks behind us have blown in, and anyway, like the infamous mad trapper, we were likely walking backwards from the place we started from. If we're lucky, maybe we'll get a sniff of something we can't see through the hoar-frosted air. All we have with us is desire and our love for language, for bird song, trout song, gopher song, woman song. Algorithm, the way out. Start in the north corner of the field. Let the wind unroll its scroll, winterly unwritten. The snow is deepest there. Head south, head down, limbs heavy. Boots break through, your spine shudders. Don't worry if you go under. Griefs a snowdrift that thickens as you walk. Weather it. There's no if in the coldest season. Just numbness in the four directions, in the heart. Here be whiteout, be shatter. Footfall after footfall on fallen nimbus, your mother's bones across your eyes, so you won't go blind. The tension, the slight shifting we feel in our calves and thighs, as if we're walking on a newly frozen lake, our fear of breaking through, these have to be at the heart of what we inscribe in the chill. And through it all, we know we are failing, we are forgetting, we are losing our way, our tongues blunt with winter. Still, we chance speaking, we stake everything we love on it. Rainer Maria Rilke said, as poets, we must place our hands on the earth like the first human being. Because I'm from a northern country, I say we must place our hands on the ice like the last. We must write the only words we'll ever write, taking our whole lives to do it and falling falling into a language so cold and elemental, so close to the truth, it makes our teeth ache. And we must fine-tune the bones of our inner ears to hear what we miss in the usual noise of our days, the rhyme of a spider's web, the ancient dithyrams of migrating flocks dying out, the stroke of a cat's whiskers across the keys. Such. Close to your ear, a swallow's wings are paper flipping, small, small notebook made of grace and fall. High above, tundra swans evoke the wind, skimming across hard drifts of snow. But the great gray owl, a child's breath is louder in the air. Only a shadow flies through the dark on such hungry wings. <coughs> Stanley Kunitz, in his 90s, described the writing of poetry as the most difficult, solitary, and life-enhancing thing that anyone could do. If he's right, why don't we just abandon the effort and do something that requires less of us. <laughs> From the first time I read Patrick Lane's poetry, and Patrick, by the way, who's my husband, I think was the first Ralph Gustafson writer in residence here 20 years ago. At that time, you had to be here for a week and visit a lot of classes, if I remember correctly. Um, he's in the hospital right now, by the way, so send him your blessings. 
From the first time I read Patrick Lane's poetry, long before we met, I knew he traveled in dangerous territory with his writing, and that for all of poetry's long and honored history, he was on his own. In his memoir, There is a Season, he gives us a glimpse of the start of his career when he worked in a sawmill in a small, isolated town in BC. He was in his mid-twenties with three kids under four and a wife, not me, who <laughs> wanted to be anywhere else. He writes, Late at night, after my wife and children were asleep, I would sit at the tiny kitchen table in front of our trailer and try to turn words into poems. Never in my life had I tried to do anything so difficult. I knew what a good poem was, I'd read the poets, but I couldn't do what they could do. I couldn't write about daffodils and skylarks or about Massachusetts, Black Mountain or San Francisco. They weren't what I knew. Their words were not from where I had been made. Without advice or help from anyone, I wrote about what happened around me. A dead baby in a trailer, a woman who died when she tried to abort herself with a coat hanger, the sound of the rivers that coursed down the mountains. A bear rummaging in my burning barrel in a vola was the subject of the first successful poem I wrote. I had no teachers, no mentors, no education beyond high school, but I had what all artists need, and that was an obsession and a total commitment to the voice I heard inside me. I think back to that time, the mills and first aid, the poverty and struggle, the joy and bitterness, and I know the only thing that kept me going, the only thing that kept me alive, was poetry. His lifelong dedication to the inner voice he heard bore a cost. Poetry made him other, different from the rest. Though in the mill towns of his early working life he drank the same whiskey, and went to the dance halls, dances in the hall on Friday nights, and sometimes got into fist fights. A couple of the men he used to work with attended one of his book launches decades later. Not regular poetry readers, they were able to say they were proud of him, but they'd always <coughs> known he wasn't one of them. He was an odd duck. Someone who had books sent in by train. Someone who used words when he let them slip that no one else spoke around there. Words like veritable, salacious, perdition. <laughs> Although poetry is a communal act, it can set you apart from your community. It tells the story before many are ready to hear it. That can be a perilous or at least an isolating thing to do. February 20th. The diphthong of wind and snow, the single sound they make when joined together. Now that she's quit smoking and doesn't need to bum a cigarette, weathers her way to talk to strangers. Is it cold enough for you? No one refuses to reply, even in the grumpy 6 p.m. what's for supper grocery line or at the liquor store where there's an urgency to get the bottle home. Though if she'd said in any cue, the diphthong of wind and snow, the adjectives diphthongal, she'd get a look and maybe silence the kind that follows her answer to the question, what do you do? That is, if she tells the truth, I write poetry. On the flight to the all-inclusive, the man beside her averted his whole self and suddenly developed an interest in the nothing he could see outside, as if she'd replied, I torture chickadees. <laughs> Which brings up who she writes for. 
Does anyone buy a book of poems anymore? <laughs> it's February 20th. Outside Max Milk, there's a wind chill. To say the least, exposed flesh will freeze under five. Do you have a light? Rilke, in a letter around mid-career, wrote from Paris, where he'd gone to see an exhibit by Cezanne, Surely all art is the result of one's having been in danger, of having gone through an experience all the way to the end where no one can go any farther. I write out of that sense of danger Rilke refers to, not by mustering a bravery that may be difficult to find, but by discovering in my body the poem's personal and peculiar music, so that each sentence will be a small, convincing melody in the ear. Above all and after all, a poem insists on music. It is the fidelity to that music that takes a writer to places she wouldn't go in a more prosaic and rational discourse. And it is a flaw in the music an unintentional stumble that alerts the writer to a prevarication, a sideways slip into a smallness of mind, character, or diction that betrays the integrity of the poem. Sometimes I see the poet as a snake charmer. We know something alarming is in the basket, but we want to draw it out anyway. <laughs> we sway, we use our breath, we turn ourselves into music. We charm what frightens us, what haunts us. We offer a song for it to dance to, so for now, it won't do us harm. What the snake brings to the world. Without the snake, there'd be no letter S, no fork, tongue, and toil, no pain and sin. No wonder the snake's without shoulders. What could bear such a weight? The snake's responsible for everything that slides and hisses, that moves without feet or legs. The wind, for example the sea with its long sweeps to shore and out again. The snake has done some good then. Even sin to the ordinary man brings its pleasures. And without the letter S, traced belly-wise outside the gates of Eden, we'd have to live with the singular of everything. <laughs> Sparrow, ear, heartbeat, mercy, truth. With each new piece, writers go into unmapped linguistic territory where they can rely on no euphemism, no tried and true, no familiar adjective-noun combination. In striking out into this terrain, a writer commits to a tough and unflinching fidelity to language. That's all she has. Good readers recognize it when they come across it. Each word feels right, but hard won, the only possible choice, though it's not easy to find, and it's tempting to give up and fall back on the customary and undisturbing. In the act of its being formed, the poem sparks a connection between the writer and other living things, but it's also a psychopomp that initiates an intimate conversation with the dead. A poet cannot turn away from that, but must keep moving, pulled by the energy of the poem itself, beyond her control, beyond logic or ego, one word linked to the next and the next in a symphony of sound and meaning and revelation. This is our work and it's mind work, body work, soul work. What the soul doesn't want. Not a plastic bucket. Not a logging truck. Not homemade wine wrung from turnips. 
not a fox with rabies. The soul might accept a rat mother, an eel basket woven from wicker, a leather collar that reeks of goat. Not a gas station with the light shot out, not gravity. Not a mask that keeps the body breathing. The soul doesn't want another face, not even the face of a snowy owl. Sometimes what's at risk has to do with content. The brazenness required when the writer exposes herself, when she takes on the simple, difficult, and hazardous task of telling her truth, of saying, this is who I am. In John Berger's book, Here is Where We Meet, she'll come across a passage he feels is important enough to repeat. He uses it once at the beginning and then at the very end. It's a conversation between him and his dead mother, and it goes like this. Berger says, I risk to write nonsense these days. His mother replies, just write down what you find. I'll never know what I've found. No, you'll never know. All you have to do is know whether you're lying or whether you're telling the truth. You can't afford to make a mistake about that distinction any longer. I take to heart this small wisdom Berger has his mother carry from the land of the dead. And of course, she's not speaking of truth with a capital T. She's talking about one person's genuine expression, his emotional and intellectual veracity, the truth of his being, his bone truth. It lies outside time and outside autobiography, yet it can be highly personal, and often it hurts to say it. When you write it, when you hear it, you feel that it's something that matters, something not only significant, but necessary. Necessary to you, to a reader you hope, but maybe more importantly to the language itself. As if you're paying tribute to the words you piece together, saying to them in the act of writing, yes, you can say even this. Winter Solstice. Past the middle of his life, he said, I'm lost. I can't find my way. Not knowing, I believe, Dante's opening lines. The room fell silent. We could feel the pull of darkness. We lifted our feet from the floor to the couch. He'd never been more beautiful. This man I found difficult to love. His wife began to weep. The dog whined for his tin of meat. Outside, snow fell so slowly, the trees had to drag it to the ground. When you write with minimal disguise about your life, and not all writers do, but I've been known to, especially in my early work, you may dig up things that those close to you have buried, exposing who they are to the world. You jeopardize their emotional safety and your relationship with them. What does a writer do about the privacy of others, about the ownership of the story we want to tell? I'm not talking about the protocols surrounding the telling of stories from other people's cultures, that's another topic, but the set of rules you forge for yourself when you're using material from your family and those with whom you're intimate. What do writers do about the possibility of their work hurting others? Annie Dillard took the ethical route. She said, I promised my family that each may pass on the book. I've promised to take out anything that anyone objects to, anything at all. I don't believe in a writer's kicking around people who don't have access to a printing press. They can't defend themselves. 
In the past, I did not follow Annie Dillard's lead. If I thought of showing my family what I'd written about them in my poems and essays, if I'd allowed my mother's presence in my room during my hours of work, my tongue would have turned to stone. I worry about injuring her. Of course, she was my mother. I loved her. But I didn't want her by my side when I tried to put pen to paper. Reading Merwin. The early sun makes of the small glass feeder outside my window a twist of light, the kind the dying say they move toward. I am sitting inside in the blue chair, book open in my lap. I am loath to raise my head to face the morning. Shadows of hummingbirds flit across the page, the plain, immovable type. The poem my finger follows, as if I'm writing words in air, insists, something I've not done is following me. When I was commissioned by Carol Shields to submit an essay for the First Drop Threads anthology almost 20 years ago, I decided to write about my father's drinking. It was the wide shadow cast over my family, and it contributed to our isolation, poverty, and shame. My mother didn't talk about his addiction to any of her friends, and she told me to do the same. What happens in the family, she believes, stays in the family. My essay opens with the sentence, my father was a drunk. And it goes on to reveal how my mother's insistence on secrecy damaged me. I didn't worry about her response because I thought she'd never read my words. My hometown, Swift Current, didn't have a bookstore. Her friends weren't literary, so no one would find the essay and show it to her. As well, I'd assume that the anthology would be one of those small lost books that would quickly go out of print. <laughs> I didn't need to worry. What no one predicted, including the editors and publisher, was that it would sell thousands of copies, go into numerous print runs, and generate three more editions. One morning, about a year after its publication, my mother phoned, as she always did on a Sunday. I'd been away the week before, so we hadn't talked in 14 days. The first thing she said was, you've done a terrible thing. No one, not even an adult in her 50s, wants to hear her mother say that. <laughs> in the brief silence following her words, when I kept thinking, what does she know, what does she know, I tried to imagine what it was I possibly could have done. My mother had attended the same church for five decades. She was sitting in her usual spot, in her usual pew, surrounded by women her age, friends, you could say, though she'd never told them what she'd suffered in her marriage. She assumed they didn't know. The lay minister, a young modern woman, introduced her sermon by saying she was going to read from an essay written by a local writer. <laughs> she said my name, then started off. My father was a drunk. I could not have planned a worse scenario. A worse way for my mother to have discovered my betrayal. <clears throat> On the phone, she told me I was lucky I'd been away the Sunday before when this had happened because she'd had time to stew about it and she wasn't angry with me anymore. <laughs> but I could still hear the barb in her voice. If not anger, then disappointment, hurt, a kind of stunned disbelief that I would do such a thing. This, for me, was the biggest peril of telling the truth about my life. I gambled that she'd never read or hear about this story, but I lost the bet. I hurt my mother. I put her well-being in her community, her sense of privacy and pride, in jeopardy. Friends who wanted to comfort me expressed anger at the insensitivity <coughs> of the lay minister. 
Didn't she know your mother was a member of the congregation, they asked. They reminded me that my story had brought comfort to others who had lived with alcoholism and been disgraced into silence. Many strangers wrote to me to tell me what my confession had meant to their own healing. Some even said reading about my experience had changed their lives. None of this mattered. It wasn't the minister's fault. It was mine. No matter how many people the story might have helped, it hurt my mother. Nothing was worse than that. Lilac. The color the skin holds after some hurt has happened. The scent the body folds in its shadows, almost sickening when the blossoms brown. And it stays with you, like the first smell of your own sex on your fingertips, like the shallows on a woman's temples when she is sick to death. It's the color of her eyelids when she doesn't see you anymore, the color the tongue takes on when there's nothing left of speaking, when sorrow burns your mouth, those small mauve flames tasting of your mother's nipples turned to ash. Most writers I know, at some point or another, have drawn on the lives of their parents. But what about their children? This must be an even trickier moral <laughs> quandary. Several, several years ago, the essayist Susan Olding and her husband adopted a baby in China. This little girl, although adored by her new parents, had numerous behavior problems that became more evident in their early years together and challenged the way the three of them could function as a family. Susan, who had begun writing about this, was invited to be a fellow at a writer's retreat in the States. All the famous writers who were there said things like, write about what obsesses you, write what you can't get your head around, what keeps you awake. Susan said to herself, my daughter is what obsesses me. My daughter keeps me awake. Her mentor supported her, in fact, commended the quality of her writing and her bravery following the student reading where she presented an early draft. Yet after she took the same material to the workshop the next morning, these are the comments she took away. The famous memoirist said, Renunciation is also part of the writing life. I would worry about you as a person and a writer if you pushed into the limelight with this material. Save yourself as a writer. The teaching fellow who worked with her one-on-one -on -one said, ethically, this is wrong. It would represent a huge betrayal. Writing it would violate confidentiality and would irreparably damage the relationship with your daughter. Her classmates, having heaped her with praise when she read her work in progress the night before, suddenly did an about-face. It's not your story. It's your daughter's story. You shouldn't write this. It's too risky for your child. You'll ruin your daughter's life. Susan had to overcome these criticisms and the threats to her own sense of what it meant to be a good mother when she decided to publish the piece in her 2008 collection, Pathologies. Her struggle with her imperative to tell the story makes palpable the incendiary consequences of writing about those we love. More last questions. What is the grass? The lost ones talking. What is the forest? Lights, tall coffins. What is the ocean? An old book of blues the whales leave behind. What is the tongue? Nobody speaks under the snow. No, what is the tongue? Heel of snake thumb of earthworm. No, what is the tongue? The moon caught in a trap, 
chews off its right leg, then its left, so it can rise. Now that I have fewer years ahead of me than behind, I often dwell on one of poetry's most challenging undertakings, the recovery and verbal dusting off of lost time. Not to redeem it, but to prevent it from slipping entirely away. In this, the poet is doomed to failure. Considering how many words I've spent in this endeavor, and others have in every genre, I can't help think of Proust. The most recent preferred English translation of the title of his literary marathon could be a metonym for poetry, in search of lost time. I completed only two of the seven volumes, and that was long ago, but last week another writer related to me a compelling scene near the end of Proust, in which the reclusive narrator, who hasn't seen many of his friends in years, decides to go to a party. When he walks in the room, he's furious that no one has warned him it's a costume party. Everyone is wearing white wigs. No, not white wigs. They, like him, have grown old. <laughs> it has happened that fast. And it's that unnerving. Once I was the youngest poet invited to literary festivals. Suddenly, almost overnight, I'm the oldest. And I wonder now, having been a wordsmith for over 40 years, if it takes more courage, both on the page and in front of an audience, to speak the truth of your life when you're older, perhaps because that territory in literature is relatively unchartered. Poems and stories built from the raw materials of aging are rare. In a culture of youth, who wants to hear gerontic voices? I've heard people speak about long-in-the-tooth writers the way they complain about senior rock stars. <laughs> How dare Mick Jagger, at 75, run around the stage, his large mouth belting, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> Isn't it mortifying to watch him? Isn't it annoying to hear that so-and-so has just published his 15th book? Oh. Help me find the metal to resist the call to go quietly into that good night. No matter how many years under my belt, may I have the audacity to open my mouth and wail. <laughs> From Time Studies. You wonder why so many old women collect small spoons. <laughs> you don't. You don't, though you are old now, too. Everything you stir, everything you spoon into your mouth demands something bigger. As if your tongue were a gift from a giant. As if your gut craved a wheelbarrow of meatloaf. A cloud fat with hail the size of baseballs, the size of a common, ordinary grief. To continue to grow, a writer has to dare to be an idiot, to be reckless, to be wrong. We forgive the foolishness of the young. We even find it charming, more than we do that of the old. Poets are expected to die before they drool on the page in public, <laughs> before they become an embarrassment to themselves and their readers, or if they continue to go on, we expect them to act and speak with gravitas. In the culture I grew up in, epithets like the following attach themselves to the should-be-admired, gray-haired purveyor of words. Wise, sententious, gracious, dean-like, dignified in comfort and speech. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> the Irish writer, Evan Boland, said, I want a poem I can grow old in. 
Her statement inspires me. It's a call to writers to craft the kind of poem that shines with, with necessity, with defiance, with lust, with madness, though it may be written by a rachitic hand. In so many ways, I am not the woman I used to be. As I change inside and out, what will the poems of my dotage look like? Do they need another form, a different kind of diction? How will I touch with words those places that aging makes tender? I don't know. What I do know is that the days are shrinking and that as I set out into the lengthening dark, it is a journey I must embark on alone. Not troubled by her breath, held by the hand of God, not what she is, but the small thing she once was, a wood mouse, a cow's eye, a leaf chameleon. Touched is what they call the crazy. Standing on two legs doesn't feel good to her. Comfort doesn't feel good to her. She chops a hole in the ice, then stretches out, out face suspended above the cold, so her spirit can reach down to what looks up from that dark water. <coughs> Over 30 years ago, I wrote a series called The Penis Poems, which seemed daring for the time, though my intent was not to shock, but to explore my own heterosexuality when several women theorists were questioning how you could love a man and be a feminist. Here's just one short stanza from a poem called Poem for Sigmund, just to give you a taste. <laughs> it's a funny thing, a brontosaurus with a long neck and pea-sized brain. <laughs> Only room for one thought, and that's not extinction. <laughs> it was a series that cost me. People walked out of readings, including at the University of Toronto, which I thought was always such a sophisticated place. I bought hate mail, one letter outlined in black tape, like a death notice. Remember, this is before social media. And a member of the Governor General's jury told me that because of that selection of poems, my book, which had been shortlisted, didn't win. 10 years ago, I wrote a piece called My Last Erotic Poem, a tongue-in-cheek treatise on what it's like for two old people to make out. I worried more about the audience response to it than to the more graphic penis poems because it shone a light on the aging body and the endurance of desire. It kicks apart the assumption that in the bedroom of a couple, both over 60, the only sex that can be found is in the word sexagenarian. <laughs> <laughs> to my surprise, the poem was an instant hit, as much as a poem can make that claim, but again, I was stepping into delicate territory. At first, my husband asked me not to read it if he was in the room. <laughs> he felt embarrassed by the description, though he knew better than anyone that much of the poem was a fiction. Really, at the point of my writing it and its publication, we weren't as hopeless and decrepit as I made us out to be. <laughs> my last erotic poem. Who wants to hear about two old farts getting it on in the back seat of a Buick, in the garden shed among vermiculite, in the kitchen where we should be drinking Ovaltine and saying no? Who wants to hear about 26 years of screwing, our once not unattractive flesh 
now loose as unbaked pizza dough, hanging between two hands before it's tossed. Who wants to hear about two old lovers slapping together like water hitting mud, hair where there shouldn't be, and little where there should, my bunion foot sliding up your bony calf, your calloused hands sinking in the quick slide of my belly, our faithless bums, crepitous, collapsed. We have to wear our glasses to see down there. When you whisper what you want, I can hear. But do it anyway. And somehow get it right. Face it. Some nights we'd rather eat a Hagen Doss ice cream bar or watch a movie starring Nick Nolte, who looks worse than us. Some nights we'd rather stroke the cats. Who wants to know when we get it going, we're revved up. Like the first time, honest, like the first time. If only we could remember it. <laughs> Our old bodies doing what you know bodies do. Worn and beautiful and shameless. <laughs> I'm wrapping it up now. <laughs> Don't keep people from receptions. <laughs> Dorothy Livesey, when she was a septuagenarian, asserted, the woman I am is not what you see. I'm not just bones and crockery. <laughs> Another respected Canadian poet, 21 years my senior and important to my generation, stopped giving readings in her late 60s. I was teaching at the University of Victoria at the time and wanted my students to hear her. In trying to persuade her, I asked why she turned down the invitation. She said, I don't want people looking at me. I think of her now as I watch the young in their finery approaching the mic with what looks like a confidence stride. Over the years, where does such confidence go? The years of experience, the awards, the supposed wisdom, they don't help me with the challenges of what I'm working on now, or lessen the vulnerability a new book engenders as it's about to make its way into the world. In moments of despair, it's easy to feel like some relic from the past, a footnote to the action, a forgotten piece of marginalia in the books the bloggers praise, an afterthought, a grandmother of the word. It's well known that our skin gets thinner and bruises more easily as we age. Perhaps it does metaphorically as well. I just came across a study that claims self-esteem in adults drastically lowers after they turn 70. I think I can hear the thump as it hits the bottom. Get over it, I say to myself, but I still owe it to me and to my readers to ask if I have anything new to bring to the table I've been working at for so long. Will I know when it's time to stop? Ah, remember I warned you earlier, writing doesn't get any easier. Having faith in yourself is hard at the beginning of your career and hard at the end. Blessed with longevity, and I want to emphasize blessed, I must find ways to disrupt my own complacency. I must throw myself into the ring with the most furious, the wildest of muses even though my hip is already out of whack. <laughs> Dorothy Livesey concluded her poem that opened with, The Woman I Am Is Not What You See, with this assertion, Move over, love. Make room for me. Mm -hmm. Note, it's an imperative, and she doesn't say please. <laughs> Man from the Labyrinth. Where they got it wrong, they gave him virgins terrified, of course, and weeping. 
What he wanted was a woman whose wisdom resides in the sags and creases of the flesh. For a time, he rested his elegant head in my lap, and I found pleasure in his doorless manner, his halls of no direction. But he wore me out with his hide and seek and riddles, most not his own, what has four legs, etc. He wanted to be a different kind of trouble. Now they're back to virgins. I warn them, but what's the use? To stay alive, they have to choose to grow old. And my conclusion. W.S. Merwin, who is still going strong in his 80s, wrote, when the words had all been used for other things, we saw the first day begin. Because I can't imagine a life without poetry, without writing poetry, I have to believe there will still be a first day for me in this last phase of my diminishing life. Believe that my love of craft and the inborn imperative to find the form of a poem will lead me to places I haven't gone before, places where I can discover some shard of beauty, whether painful or healing. These are the risks I take, the nerve I ride on. As I did in the beginning, I will go word by word, searching for the right combination of those dull by daily use, yet still mysterious 26 letters of Shakespeare's alphabet, Dickinson's alphabet, Leonard Cohen's alphabet, so that I can inscribe my diminishing hours in terror and astonishment on the single page of my fierce and only life. Two short poems to conclude. What the Soul Wants. The electric in eel. One rib from any kind of whale. A moon snail's thick gray neck. Garlic scapes. A deer companion. A skink's blue tongue. Think of all the blue things it could say. self-centered. My husband is going blind. Soon, no one will say I am beautiful in my new dress, my red shoes. Or will he say it more often, old woman that I am, now that he can't see? Thank you.